the next topic is called cryptographic failures. Um, in the previous edition of the top 10 list, uh, it was called sensitive data exposure. Um, and the motivation for the name change is that cryptographic failures are the cause of the problem and sensitive data exposure is basically the result. Sometimes sensitive data exposure can also happen you know, for non-cryptographic reasons. Um, so we should keep that in mind as well. Uh, but yeah. Um, so if we look at the top three ones, like the, the most common one is use of hard-coded passwords. And this kind of relates to to the thing that I mentioned before about not committing sensitive data into, into Git um, or whatever version control you're using. Um, you know, um, just don't do that. Like there are many other ways um, or with using .n files or um, I don't know. Usually that's what, what we do or um sometimes we can also have uncommitted settings.php files for various uh, environments that you know store this sensitive things in them and that's how we we can avoid um doing that uh, then uh, we also have broken or risky crypto algorithm this refers to cryptographic algorithms that are not considered safe anymore. Um, and uh, here, the most obvious example would be MD5 hashing algorithm, which is, uh, it's, it's not considered safe anymore. Um, the same goes for SHA1. Um, there maybe are situations where they are still okay to use because you know the nature of the problem doesn't require a secure hashing algorithm as you know sha 256 or 512 are um, so you know, if you really know what you're doing you could use them in some cases but then there is also uh the fact that as soon as you use one of those algorithms and you have some either automated you know, checks going on in your CI CD stack, or you have outside security review that you need to pass or something like that, uh, this will be flagged for sure. Um, and you know, there's actually no reason not to use secure hashing algorithms everywhere. So my recommendation would be just use SHA-256 when you need hashing and, uh, and don't even consider using those ones. Um, there's really no reason not to do that. And then the third one is insufficient entropy. Um, I would say in our case, this comes to using random generators that are cryptographically secure versus random generators that are not. In PHP, for example, we have this rand function, which is a random generator, but is not cryptographically secure. Um, we can even look at the API page. So rand function, and we have this, you know, pretty big caution here that this is not cryptographically secure. So random data uh, that we got from this function should not be used with cryptographic features. Um, and this caution even suggests some other functions that are cryptographically secure, like random int or random bytes, depending what type of data you need, or open SSL random bytes. Um, and just as 
I recommended before to simply not use MD5. I would say simply don't use ran function and just use one of those. Because then, you know, you, you develop this habit. Um, and even if you know what you're doing, maybe you're in a hurry. Uh, maybe, I don't know, it happens to all of us. If you de develop this habit of always using cryptographically secure random generators, you will be on the safe side uh, no matter what. So I, I would recommend you to do that. Like what I personally do, um, I use these even in, in unit tests because it's just like I'm used to using those and don't even bother using RAND anymore. Um, and I know that in, in unit tests, there would be nothing wrong with RAND, but it's just a habit. And I think it's a good habit. Um, then in this cryptographic failures topic, we also have consideration about data that is in transit versus data that is, that is addressed. Uh, when it comes to data that is, that is at transit, um, you know, we have to ensure that we are transmitting data over safe protocols. Uh, so on the web, I see no reason whatsoever to use plain HTTP anymore. Um, I think that we should always use HTTPS in the past, we you know we had problems with where to get certificates that would be you know, accepted by browsers and all that. Nowadays, we have Let's Encrypt, um, which works in every major browser, um, and even on on most cloud hosting providers, uh, they can be enabled with a single click or are even enabled by default. So. No, I, I think that we should always use HTTPS. Um, and even more than that, if we always use HTTPS, then we can also use uh, HSTS header, um, which tells browsers that this domain that we are serving from will never transmit anything over plain HTTP, uh, which will then result in browser complaining very loudly if something is supposedly served from a plain text protocol um, from supposedly our domain, which is, could be something that an attacker would do. So um, yeah, definitely, I think. And, and I do think that, that for the most part, we are doing a pretty good job with that. Um, then when it comes to protocols, like. We also, our projects will communicate with other systems you know, to get data, to send data and all that. Um, sometimes this goes over HTTP, where again, we should always use HTTPS, uh, but then sometimes we also use other protocols like you know FTP and LDAP and, and whatnot. So we should try to avoid using protocols that are unsecure, like plain FTP, plain SMTP um, and use you know, counterparties that are using secure channels instead. Because um, you know, every time when we use a plain protocol and sending data around in plain text, we are risking that somebody will be sniffing on the network traffic somewhere and we will pretty quickly expose either our passwords or you know, God forbid something even more critical, such as like personally identifiable information of our users, some financial data or you know, many other things that, that we want to keep secure. And then when it comes to uh, data at rest, the best, um, the best tool that we have is to actually not store the data. Um, so first question that we should ask ourselves is, do we really need to store this thing that we think we need? And if the answer is no, then just don't store it and 
that's the safest way to do it. Um, if that's not the case, which you know, a lot of times it's not, we have a few module uh, modules um, that that in Drupal that that, that can um, help us secure this data. Uh, and I will show you a few. So first one would be an encrypt module. So this is a module for Drupal 8 and 9, and also for Drupal 7. Um, and it's an API module that uh, provides tools for symmetric and asymmetric encryption. So it's quite a low level thing. Um, and uh, then there are modules that integrate with it. Um, so one interesting could be field encryption, uh, which will let you uh, encrypt your fields on your entities. Um, so if you, you know, if you have, let's say you have a user profile and then on the user profile, you have social security number or something like that. And you want to protect that social security number when, when it's in the database, um, you could use field encryption module to do that. Um, then obviously you need to make sure that your encryption keys are not exposed uh, to everyone. Um, uh, you have to make sure that you use different encryption keys in different environments. You have to make sure that your encryption keys are you know, obviously not committed in, in the uh, Git repository and things like that. But, you know, it's, as we said, it's another layer that uh, gives us some protection. And you know, if other layers fail, this layer could uh, save us. Um, and we also have web form encrypt, which will encrypt web form uh, responses, if that's what you need. Um, file encrypt that will encrypt files um, and so on. So definitely something you can, you can look at. Then another module that can be useful is the key module. Um, which you know there it's it's a tool to securely manage various uh sensitive keys um i personally prefer to do these things on the infrastructure level uh you know either through dot n files or through uncommitting local settings php files whatever fits better but you know, if you like something that that has a UI and it's more so oriented towards site builders, a key module is uh, something we can definitely look at. Another module that not specifically related uh, to cryptographic failures, but you know, it's definitely useful. It's security review module. Um, security review will do uh, numerous checks related to security and you know list any problem that it finds. So this could be uh, a good thing to use, uh, for example, on a checklist, on a before go live checklist, uh, you, you enable this module and check if everything is, is in order just to you know, add another layer of security. So let me see if I have anything else in my notes. Yeah, another another um, thing that is very important, and in our case, it's handled very well with uh, by Drupal itself is password hashing. Like a lot of times, we would have uh, sites either storing passwords, plain text in the database, which is really bad, or using unsecure uh, 
algorithms to hash passwords. And that is important because if our hashed passwords are leaked somehow, for example, you know, by exposing our database backups to somebody, um, that could be used to then crack those hashes and figure out users' passwords. And since users tend to use the same password on many different sites, then this becomes a really big problem. Um, and you now if we are not, if we are not implementing this ourselves, and we should not in Drupal, uh, Drupal uses PHPath um, to do that in a secure way. Um, so you know, something to be aware of. It's an, an interesting algorithm to look at if you want to study it, uh, how it works. Um, it's implemented in this PHPath hashed password class. Um, but you know, if we're just using it, um, it's basically there and doing its job for us. Um, and that's it. And we are thankful for that and, 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 and happy. Um, so yeah, like a lot of, a lot of times in Drupal, like don't reinvent the V the wheel. Don't, you know, re-implement APIs that Drupal already provides because this is basically the reason why we're using Drupal. Um, sometimes these APIs are a little bit harder to understand. I'm aware of that. Not in this case, because this is really, you know, just works behind the scenes out of the box. But sometimes things like form API and caching API can be a little bit hard to understand. But when you when you master it, um, it also becomes quite easy. And here we come back to the culture thing. Like even if it seems harder to do that, to do something in a proper way using Drupal's APIs, it's really worth investing some time and learning things. And then even more importantly, helping other teammates to learn that same thing as well, um, then going and, and hacking your own solution from scratch, because that will always end up being problematic at the end. Um, and culture and peer reviews relate to this aspect from, from the point of view that, you know, if we see something that is wrong, somebody trying to reinvent the wheel, we should raise our raise our voice, let them know, and you know, talk inside the team why this is important and how we will you know learn to properly use systems that we have and that come with Drupal because um, it will be better for us in the long term. It might require slightly bigger investment of time and usually not that much at the beginning but then long term we will be on a much safer side and not only security wise but also performance wise and and you know updates will probably be easier because if we're using apis that come with core core won't just break stuff while if we do things in some weird custom way um core might unintentionally break something that you know we took for granted so again culture and peer reviews and uh being open to learn all the time that's also something that's very important in our industry in general are there Thank any you. questions Giannis, you want to take a, a, a minute or two break before we jump into the next one? Maybe. No, I'm fine. We can continue. Awesome. I, I do have I, a question. Yeah, sure. Can you give any insight about the use of the HSTS uh, header? And here, here's our challenge. Our main application, it's not Drupal, but it is written all in PHP. And we use HTTPS there throughout. Every, and we force a redirect on that. 
but we have legacy content on our CDN that links to um, from our from our main application that does not support HTTPS. Mm -hmm. So, is there any insight besides change the legacy content so you can support HTTPS? With because the challenge that we have is if we implement the HT or the HT or HSTS header, we're going to start to get errors coming back from that yeah. um, from that legacy content. No, I don't think like besides trying to move. The, the legacy content to HTTPS, I don't think that you have any other options because this is this is basically the point of HT, um, HSTS, sorry. Um, that's the whole point, communicating to browsers that all the content that we will be serving from this domain will come from through over a secure channel. And if we are breaking that ourselves, then it won't work. Um, yeah. So depending depending how what kind of this system is, you could no. If you cannot change the system, you could maybe put like an SSL terminator in front of it, um, and you know proxy proxy traffic to this legacy content tr through that SSL terminator, for example. This could be one solution that uh, and. This can be implemented without touching the legacy system and just putting something in front of it. So maybe that's what you could do. Actually, thank you for that. I hadn't, I hadn't, I hadn't even thought about that as an option, but that might be something we can look at for it. Um, changing, you know, in an ideal world, we could update all the legacy content, but um, the, the, the that's a monumental task. So maybe okay. something like what you suggested, proxy and SSL terminator, might be a way to look at. It. Uh, we, we unfortunately don't live in an ideal world, so. <laughs> <laughs> if we don't. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. You're we welcome. just implemented a, uh, a similar system. Janis just built a, a proxy for a, a massive migration where a lot of the legacy content can't be migrated in time. So it, um, it has to solve problems like this among many other things. So it's sort of like a, dynamic translator to make it seem as if some legacy content has been migrated to the new system to be able to launch the rest and buy them another year. Um, so happy to share some of what we've done on that front uh, outside of this. Any other questions for Yanis? Awesome. I wonder if marketing folks got involved or more involved in the OWASP. I love the rebranding uh, of that topic to uh, cryptographic failures uh, as the cause as opposed to the original, which was the, the solution. Um, I think um, I also love the fact that they're combining things now. <laughs> it's, it's really the OWASP 11, because uh, next up is injection and cross-site scripting. 